let's see if you feel that way at the end of the talk. So. Do I need to press this record? Button? It's already set. Oh, it's already set. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I, in in working on this talk yesterday, I was trying to figure out, you know, what kind of an audiences are going to be here, and it looks like it's a pretty eclectic audience. We've got some social control virgins in here, I think, and we have others who uh, know social control pretty well. So I think what I want to do is just start off, for those of you who are, are not that familiar with criminological theory literature, and just talking about a few of the major assumptions behind social control theory. Now, if, if I give that to you right up front, uh, then I think that will help you to follow some of the assumptions uh, that, about the theory that we're going to talk about uh, in the next half hour or so. So I hope, so I'll start off with just a few basic assumptions that are pretty common. Uh, a lot of people know them already uh, to the theory. Then I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> early development of social control theory. Uh, then some of the premises and assumptions in social control theory and then in depth, if we have time, talking a little bit about two of the more recent uh, control theories, uh, which are Godfordson and Hershey's self-control theory and Samson and Lobb's uh, age-graded social control or life course theory. Uh, but we'll see. I'll see how much time we have when we get there. Uh, you can, I'm not a theorist. I, and uh, Walter told you that. I, I'm really a positivist. I'm an empiricist. I, I like to take theories and derive hypotheses from them and then test theories to see whether or not uh, I come up with empirical support or not for them. And most of the, throughout most of my academic career, I have focused in on various forms of social control theories. Uh, but in working on this edited book with L. Edward Wells, we did a lot of comparisons among the different social control theories, and we've also been working on a paper uh, that we first gave at the American Society of Criminology uh, Conference back in the early 90s. And so I'm drawing on those two things, the introductory chapter to the book and then, and then this 18-year-old uh, paper that I've been working on forever uh, to kind of analyze social control theory and kind of analytically put it together and show you some commonalities and differences among the different social control theories. Okay, so some original, some uh, initial assumptions. You can kind of break down a lot of criminological theories versus those that look at restraints or controls and those that look at motivations. Most of the earlier <coughs> theories of criminology and crime were motivational in nature, meaning that there was something that motivated motivated a person to commit crime, whether it be strain, whether it be subcultural theories, whatever it was, it motivated you to become a criminal. So conformity was taken for granted, and what these earlier theorists tried to do was explain crime. Social control theory does just the opposite. It assumes that everybody is motivated to commit crimes, everybody is motivated towards deviance, so what it really tries to do is explain conformity. And it explains it through the use of social controls or restraints. What is it in the social structure or in more, not social structure, but social relations and attachments and such in society that keeps you from committing a crime even in the face of wanting to do it? Why do you not jump over the teller's window and, and steal $2,000 at the bank when you're at the bank? It's sitting right there in front of you. Why don't you do that? Why don't you steal a CD, a music CD, well, they probably don't even have music CDs anymore, right? it's all MP3s. Why don't you steal that MP3 player when you're at Best Buy, when nobody's looking, there are no cameras and such? What keeps you from doing that, even in the face of motivations of really wanting to have that MP3 player? So that, that's one of the first assumptions. It also means that social control theories are a type of rational choice theory. That, that it's, it's a neoclassical theory in terms of criminological theories. In other words, um, man is a motivated being who has choices. And so from a deterrence perspective, which is a type of control theory, uh, when you're trying to decide whether or not you're going to steal that MP3 player, you say, well, you know, if I steal it, 
Well, I'm going to get to listen to a lot of great music. I won't have to listen to Dr. Rankin's lectures. I can be listening to music during that. And uh, it'd be great to have it, and I can't afford it. On the other hand, if I get caught, you know, I'll probably end up uh, being booked and fingerprinted, might spend a night or two in jail. And so it's a rational choice. A, a person sits there and has a rational choice and tries to figure out the good parts of stealing that versus the bad parts of what would happen if he gets caught. And that's what social control theory is, weighing the choices of attachments to other people and combinations of, of, of relationships with people, and will you jeopardize that if you get caught for doing this? Other theories, the motivational theories that I just talked about, are more deterministic in nature. Uh, if you have this uh, social strain that determines that you should commit a crime, and so it's much more deterministic, gets away from man, seeing man as a rational human being that has choices that he can make. As a result, many of the deterministic theories are thought to overly predict crime, because certainly not everybody who, fo who has social strain or lives in, a so lives in a bad neighborhood of Chicago is going to become a criminal or a juvenile delinquent. But according to the theory, they should be. So, so deterministic theories are thought that they overly determine or overly predict crime, whereas the rational choice social control theories are thought to be more probabilistic in nature. If you have this social relationship or this social control, it's less likely that you're going to commit a crime. So that's another difference among some of these theories. So with that in mind, and I'm going to come back to these themes, but with that in mind, let's, let me kind of go to uh, the main part of what I was going to talk to today. First of all, the, the concept of social control is very basic to social sciences. Uh, theorists as long ago as E.A. Ross in 1901 and up until Jack Gibbs in 1989 maintained that sociology is really essentially the study of social control. It's looking at what controls our behaviors, what, how we get socialized into doing what we're doing. Gibbs especially in 1989 even argued that Social control is sociology's central notion. It's the raison d'etre of, of sociology. This is what we should really be studying. So what then is social control theory? Well, social control theory really refers to a cluster of theoretical positions that have the same assumptions, that all have the same assumptions. They're a little bit different from each other, and I'll talk about that later. But they all have these same assumptions that I just talked about, looking at restraints or controls, having rational choice uh, as part of the theory, uh, pre trying to predict conformity rather than crime, along with above another bunch of assumptions. But that's what makes it a social control theory. The major factor is we're looking to see if these people have internal constraints or external constraints or both or none of them. And that's what's going to predict whether or not uh, offenders are going to be offending or not. Looking at these external constraints that I'll define a little bit later, internal constraints for both of these. Prior to Hershey's seminal work in 1969, uh, social control theory was seen only as an important theme in criminological theory. And I'll talk a little bit about the earliest theories and theorists in the 1950s. But before 1969, social control wasn't even really seen as a theory. If you look at Vold's theoretical criminology, which has been around for a long time, and now it's Vold and Bernard, social control wasn't even seen as a, have its own theoretical framework or chapter in that book until the third edition, which I think didn't come out until about 1990. So prior to Hershey, uh, certainly Hershey was not the, he's best known and probably uh, the most uh, uh, research theory, but prior to him, we didn't really see social control as a theory. Subsequent to that, Volt's book and others now uh, conceptualize social control as a theory in its own right. Some people depict social control theory in very specific terms. When you think of social control theory, probably most people think of Hershey's book from 1969 in social bond theory, that 
Uh, if you have social bonds or attachments to parents, peers, community, then you are less likely to commit criminality or juvenile delinquency. Others identify, uh, like I do, identify social control in more general terms, uh, kind of as a family of conceptually related terms and theories that variously explain how these group processes work uh, to, to restrain individuals from committing crimes. So if you look at what's included, and I'm not going to name them all because uh, in the book we actually argue that almost any theory uh, could be at least to some degree categorized under social control, but it would not only include Hershey's social bonding theory, but other related theories such as Reckless's containment theory, Motz's neutralization theory, drift theory, routine activities theory certainly falls under it, uh, the new Samson and Lobb lifespan development theory, uh, power, and then a number of integrated theories such as power control theory. Patterson had a big effect on, uh, on Hershey's later writings with his uh, control with learning theory. So there are a number of theories that, that really fall under the whole rubric of, of social control. So it really began in the 1950s. Uh, and, I, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, of time on this, but these were the early classic statements. These were the formative years of social control theory. Uh, they weren't, these theory, they, you could barely call them a theory at this point. They were, some, they were not assembled into <laughs> explicit, coherent theoretical models. What they did do, though, was they indicated a lot of the basic criticisms of the traditional motivational theories that we talked about. So it talked about what's wrong with the motivational theory. Let me give you one example. Reckless in the 1950s uh, came up with what he called containment theory, which was an early social control theory. He came up with this theory because the question came to him, what keeps a good kid good in a bad neighborhood? In other words, we had all of these subcultural theories on gangs and such that said if you grow up in a bad neighborhood, you're going to become a gang member and you're probably going to commit crime. Yet research again and again showed that there were a lot of good kids who never became criminal in these bad neighborhoods. He said subcultural theory, social disorganization theory, a lot of the theories at the time could not explain this. And so he came up with his containment theory, which was really a criticism of motivational theories of crime, and talked about inner and outer inner and outer containments and, and buffers and things like that. It, it, it wasn't a good theory and it was tautological in many ways, but it was an early criticism of some of these motivational theories. Uh, Jackson Toby uh, talked about having a stake in conformity, which is certainly an idea that the most recent social control theories still talk about. Sykes and Matza talked about techniques of neutralization, which talked about people who wouldn't normally commit a crime because they've been socialized not to, so they've been controlled, but there's something that might neutralize that, allowing them to commit crime. So there's something that weakens the social control. So in many ways, sex and loss theory was even a social control theory. No matter what social control theory you talk about, though, they almost all invariably assert that the family and the relationship among family members, especially between parents and children, is the most important social control out there. And there are a lot of them. I mean, you can talk about you can talk about schools, you can talk about peers, you can talk about religion. Uh, there are a lot of uh, and social other socialization processes, but almost all of these theories come back now come back to the family or to parents. Now they speak of them in different ways, and I'll and I'll talk about that in a minute. But they pretty much all come back to the family as the most important of these social controls that, that will help to restrain people's behaviors. In fact, social control theory is often thought to bring the family back into uh, theories and into empirical uh, studies simply because all the, all the theories at that time, back in the 50s, were really social structural theories, meaning they were trying to explain the relationship between why did lower class kids commit more crimes than middle and upper class kids. And later on, self-reports pretty much showed that was not the case, but that's what they thought from official statistics and officially collected statistics back in the 50s. 
And so everything was focusing on race and especially social class and SES as causes of crime. Not race, because that was related to SES, but focusing on that. And here comes along social control theory and kind of turns some of these theories on end and now starts talking about the family, which they had, uh, had not been talking about a lot. Rather than focusing on broken homes as a problem, the social control theory is really, uh, and broken home is a proxy for how good a relationship or the loss of control over kids, social control theorists came in and started talking about the quality of the family relationships between the parents and the children. So earlier, a lot of this research from the 20s and 30s, which did focus on the family, it was mainly looking at broken homes research. And broken homes means, gee, there's not another, there aren't enough parents in the household, and therefore they can't control the kids, and so that's why these kids uh, commit crimes. Social control theory says, yes, family's important, but not so much broken homes. That's just a proxy for, the, for, how, many, for how many parents are there. So really what we need to focus on are the quality of the relationships, because the home might be broken, but if the, if the mother is still, still has a good relationship with the child, it can still restrain those, her kid's behaviors and keep him or her from committing crimes. Okay, so that's a very quick look at some of the early theories of social control and how they kind of relate to some of the later theories and where we got some of the original ideas for the, for the subsequent theories of social control. So now let me go through some of the basic <clears throat> premises and assumptions of social control theory. And I touched on these right at the beginning, but let me go a little bit more into detail on them now. The first is, the first premise is the control premise. <laughs> while, we can, while we can view human behavior as a result of both motivations pushing us to do something and restraints keeping us from doing something, social control theorists invariably think that it's the social restraints that have a greater effect upon your behavior than the motivations. So that's the basic assumption behind or the basic premise behind social control theory. So restraint becomes a central analytical notion of social control theory. And, it become, and the variation in constraints and the variation in how well we socialize our children becomes a major variable that we look at from a social control perspective so that we can explain conformity or criminality based upon the variation in re, the variation in the socialization process for some kids versus others. <coughs> a second assumption behind this theory is what we call the human nature assumption. And this, this is very much a Thomas Hobbesian type of assumption. And that is motivations to engage in deviant behavior are a natural feature of human psychology. Everybody is mo motivated at one point or another to commit crime, or we have motivations, or we have impulses to take what we want, or to seek pleasurable experiences, even when we know we shouldn't be doing that. It's a normal thing, it's a natural motivation that has to be socially restrained through these social constraints in order to maintain or social order. Now, since these impulses or these motivations come naturally to everyone, social control theorists argue we don't have to explain them. So whereas all the other theories are trying to explain where does strain come from or subcultural uh, problems or biological tendencies or whatever, social control theory, and there's variation among them, mind you, but most social control theorists would argue we don't have to give them any special explanation. Motivational variables can essentially be ignored in the explanation of crime because everybody has them. The variation is in the socialization process and in the restraints, not in the motivations to commit the crimes. Another assumption is what we call the normative consensus assumption. In other words, there has to be general agreement socially in what is regarded as crime and widespread acceptance 
of the moral values in the criminal codes. In other words, uh, it's a consensus model. Not a dissensus model, model as, what you find, as what you'd find in Marxist theories, for example. In other words, there has to be a relatively objective social order. We have to be able to know right from wrong. Uh, because if we don't, conformity and control become pretty highly subjective, and it gets hard to predict if people are going to become criminals or, or non-criminals, or even define criminality from non-criminality. Another basic premise is what we call the modes of ascension of, con I'm sorry, the modes of control assumption. What are the different modes of control? What are the different techniques <coughs> for controlling behaviors? There's a whole lot of them, right? I mean, peers, what, what? Criminologists oftentimes focus on the juvenile delinquency or peers, school, and family. But there's also religion, there's also, uh, there's also a lot of siblings, there's a lot of other different things that socialize you, you know, teachers, into knowing morally what's right and what's wrong. So what we have to figure out here is what are the most important restraints? And we, and some of them are going to be much more causally effective than others. And if they're much more causally effective in restraining behaviors, they're going to be much more theoretically important to us in social control theory. So this is important because this is really what differentiates this modes of control assumption is what differentiates all the different social control theories. In other words, uh, this assumption provides the main issue for differentiating what's different between Hershey from Reese, <coughs> from Reckless, from F5 and 9, from all the others, is because they all focus in on different modes of control. And so we can distinguish them in that way. So let me give you some examples. Deterrence, which, which I wouldn't call necessarily a social control theory, but it's a control theory. It's a legal control theory. <coughs> According to deter the deterrence doctrine, the most important mode of control are legal controls, coercive legal controls. Uh, so punishments uh, or threats of punishments, according to deterrence, is the most effective means of trying to control your behavior. Okay, now look at that versus Hersey, Hershey's social bonds theory. Indirect forms of, of of control based upon social attachments, commitments, uh, being embedded in certain social relationships uh, provide the strongest control over delinquency. In fact is, Hershey argued that coercive controls weren't effective because they were too intermittent. You didn't get caught doing things enough and because they were intermittent, they were infrequent, and so how could they ever stop you from committing a crime? So really it's these social controls, these relationships that you have with parents and peers and schools, that's the most important mode of control. Gottfriedson and Hershey in their 1990 book, Self, or, uh, book Self Control and Theory, shifts from this emphasis on attachments to internal psychological controls. So at this point, they're, switch, they're asserting that behavior is largely, largely the result of personal propensities that are shaped in early childhood before the age of 10. And they call it self-control. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. But so Hershey even changed his mind over the courses of his writing. And then you have situational, one, one more example, uh, situational crime prevention and routine activities theories. These theorists argued that there's environmental control and that's the most important thing. We can stop crime or we can restrain crime through environmental controls. So how we build houses, how, how we go to work and how we drive to work and where we, what types of neighborhoods we drive through work and <coughs> where we live, all of these environmental types of structural things are the most important thing in restraining behaviors and in stopping crime. And that's the most effective way of reducing delinquency. 
Reckless makes the inner versus outer containment. Nye, uh, who, who has a really <laughs> neat theory, I think, uh, from 1958, which predates uh, Hershey by a number of years and, and, and was uh, a more general theory of, of social control even than Hershey's theory, uh, talks about direct controls or rewards and punishments and indirect controls such as attachments, like what Hershey talked about, along with internalized controls and opportunity controls, they had a fourfold classification. So modes of control is really the main thing that we can differentiate the, the social control theorists by. Uh, there's also uh, another major uh, assumption behind social control theory is the deficiency assumption. All, in other words, all social control theories are based on this underlying assumption of deficiency. In other words, if, if social control theories are aimed at trying to explain conformity through restraints, and if you commit a crime, anyway, there must be something deficient here, right? In other words, and there must be something deficient or something that went terribly wrong in the socialization process that even despite you liking your parents and running around with good peers and getting good grades in school, that you still committed some crimes. So there's some deficiency here that's going on. And so this is, this, and this assumption permeates all the social control theories as well. Another, another interesting uh, way to, to look at uh, social control theory is situational versus dispositional explanatory focuses. Okay, situational versus dispositional. In other words, the distinction here is whether social restraints are factors that people carry around with them as relatively enduring characteristics of your personality, such as self-control. Okay, so self-control would be a dispositional factor. The person carries around with him. It's part of his personality. No matter if he's in Chicago or Detroit or in the heartland of Iowa, he has this disposition of low or high self-control. Or if you view the characteristics as situations across people. Now this is more, these social control theorists are more likely, these would be situational variables and these would be people who look more, instead of at internalized controls, or self-control, for example, would look at external controls. So, for example, opportunity theory, which is really looking at environmental causes, or direct controls, such as Nye looks at, and by that he means rewards and punishments. These aren't, rewards and punishments for doing something right or doing something wrong aren't anything that you hold internal to yourself. They're external to you. So this would really be situational types of controls rather than dispositional types of controls. Now, why, I, why I'm even bringing this up is that different social control theories, without even knowing it, may be explaining different phenomena. So some explain situational patterns in crime rates while others are trying to explain individual patterns in criminal involvement. Gottfriedson and Hershey explain the difference, uh, look at the similar, but they talk about the difference between crime and criminality. It's the difference between situational <coughs> crime, and crime rates versus individual crimes and dispositions. Okay, so that, that's, kind of my, that's kind of my general look at, at different assumptions, some of the basic premises behind all the different social control theories. Let me spend just a few minutes on talking about Garfson and Hershey, maybe Samson and Lop. Uh, but Garfson and Hershey are, as, uh, came out with their book, A General Theory of Crime in 1990. Uh, and it's really been a, a lot of empirical studies done on it. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time on that and then I, I, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, Godfordson and Hershey uh, define self-control, I'm going to just read this to you, <coughs> as the differential tendency of people to avoid criminal acts, whatever the circumstances in which they find themselves. 
not a great definition, but that, that's how they define self-control. So people with high self-control then, to break, break this down <clears throat> into understandable terms, resist the immediate pleasures uh, associated with the gratification of committing a crime. People with low self-control are thought to be impulsive, uh, being sensitive to other people's feelings, wanting immediate gratification, they're risk takers or short-sighted. And so if you have low self-control, you're going to be more likely to commit crimes. And the propensity to commit a crime is directly related to whether your self-control is high or whether or not it's low. Unrestrained individuals, or those with low self-control, simply are attracted to crime pre precisely because there's an immediate gratification to it. And they can commit that crime, think they can get away with it, and they get immediate gratification. Of central importance to self-control is still the family. So even though Hershey has got a new theory here, he's still saying the family is of central importance to self-control. But it's going to be a really different take on the family, like 180 degrees different take on the family from what he thought uh, from his earlier 1969 theory. So, so let, me, let me talk a little bit or analyze how this theory now is very different from his earlier theory. Uh, first of all, self-control is now considered to be internal. It's an internalized trait that people have, that they carry. It's a dispositional trait that they carry with them wherever they go. Bonds, social bonds from his earlier theory, were mainly seen to be external to the individual. So one big difference. Both of them, both theories focus on family variables, but in a very different way. So in uh, self-control theory, Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that the main variable that, that is the, the only variable that is the cause of, of low or high self-control are family management practices. Or fam in other words, do the parents discipline correctly? Do they monitor their behaviors? Do they recognize it when you do something wrong? And do they reward or punish the behaviors accordingly? So what, what Patterson would call family management practices. This is very different from his earlier theory where he talked about the quality of the relationship between, fam between parents and children. He's gotten totally away from that now. And now he's talking about what I would call direct controls. And earlier, Hershey said that these variables aren't even important. Because remember, he argued that, uh, you know, they, they can't, they can't uh, punish every behavior. Parents never see their kids' behaviors most of the time. So how, they, how can they consistently punish or reward bad behaviors or good behaviors? So these external uh, types of of variables weren't even important. Now he's done a 180 and he's saying forget quality of relationships, those are really a result of self-control which is a result of family management practices. So he's, he's really changed his outlook on how he sees the family in this. Another difference is that with social bonding theory it's their approximate, social bonds are approximate cause of delinquency meaning that it's current. Social bonds can change over time, so that if you have high bonds with your parents at this stage in time, maybe two years later you don't get along with your parents very well, and it would open you up or free you more to commit delinquent acts. So social bonds can change. However, and this is one of the most controversial parts of this theory, self-control is a distal cause. It's something that, a distant cause. It, it's something that takes place before the age of 10, where family, where your parents are, are looking at your behaviors and telling you yes to do this and no, don't do that. And once you, and, and self-control according to Gottfriedson and Hershey is pretty much set by the age of eight or 10 and then never changes for the rest of your life. So regardless of what happens of getting married later on or getting a job or anything like that, you're pretty much set with how you're going to commit crimes by the age of 10, according to this theory. <coughs> and another very uh, 
controversial part of their theory is that then social bond theories, but almost everything that we found to be correlated with crime earlier is simply a spurious cause of crime now because it's all a result of self-control. So that relation, that strong relationship that we know about between delinquent peers and delinquency, it's spurious because that's caused because of low self-control. And once you control on low self-control, that relationship between delinquent peers and delinquency should go away. Or that high attachment you have with your parent, or that high bond you have with your, ter with your parents, it, it's simply spurious because it's now caused by low self-control. And even though it's there, once you, again, control on low self-control, <clears throat> or on self-control in your regression coefficients, that should go away. It doesn't, by the way. I mean, empirical tests have shown that that, that it doesn't go away. They seem to have both have direct and direct effects on it, but, but that's their argument. So another controversial issue of this theory is simply that uh, self-control is solely a function of early childhood development and family ma management practices. That most empirical research has found that, that while there is a relationship there, it's not the only thing that's related to self-control. Uh, a number of articles by Pratt and Turner and Picuro have found that neighborhood uh, conditions play a role in, in uh, defining self-control. Uh, also social context. Beaver and a lot, number of other people have found their biological influences on self-control and personality traits. And, and on some pretty good studies over, over with very large data samples have found uh, that there are some biological uh, tendencies towards low or high self-control as well. And uh, another controversial part of, of, of their theory is what they call the stability, the stability hypothesis. That is, and I, and I mentioned that a second ago, uh, but that self-control is fully established by age 10 and it's going to stick with you for the rest of your life. So it's unchanging during the life course. So it's unresponsive to anything. And so what happens then if, if your crime rate goes up and down over the life course? Well, it's not due to your self-control changing. It's simply variation in criminal opportunities. That maybe at some points in your life, you're more open to criminal opportunities and commit more crimes than in others. But your, well, your self-control is pretty much set at age 10. One more thing, and then, then I'll stop for, for some questions, and that is uh, Godfrey and Hershey are not big on theory integration. They, they don't think <coughs> their theory or any theories should really be, be integrated with other theories. Uh, and the fact is, uh, their theory of self-control is a totally separate theory from their bonding theory. They didn't take bonding theory and then try to tweak it and turn it into self-control theory. It's a totally new theory that <laughs> replaces social bonding theory from, from 20 years earlier. Why can't we do it? Why can't we integrate theories, even though a lot of people have tried? And, and actually, I would say that, that uh, Samson and Lobb's age-graded theory over the life course is a very good indicator that you can integrate this theory with other theories. Uh, but they said that uh, quote, logically incompatible with the underlying logic and assumptions of a restraint-oriented explanation. In other words, most, most of the other theories are motivational theories. How can you integrate a motivational theory with a, con with a restraint theory or a non-motivation theory? The underlying logic behind them is, is just too different. Uh, Determinant, the, the motivational theories are overly deterministic in nature. They overpredict criminality. They deny the, uh, the uh, possibility of individual choice. So you can't really put them together. They're, they're separate. They contradict each other. And you shouldn't be able to put them together. So uh, I, think, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, I'll stop there and see what. So the, these were some of the analyses that we've done of, of control theory, trying to look at 
you know, differences among them, what are some of the, uh, the same about many of these different theories, what are some of the basic assumptions behind them. Uh, I didn't even get buzzed in on it. Lee? You, you call yourself a positivist, and positivists have to be tough-minded when it comes to theory and so on. Uh, you know, William James had a dichotomy of temperamental types of tough-minded versus terror-minded. And theorists they should be seen as terror-minded. Um, for somebody who uh, uh, calls himself a positivist, and thus may tend to be tough-minded, maybe skeptical about a lot of theory, you presented lots of theory here. Uh, although, admittedly, uh, you say they're difficult to integrate. So maybe you pick and choose. Uh, so how is it that uh, somebody who is uh, what I call tough-minded, what James called tough-minded, uh, goes so much out all these theories? Is there a way of handling it to say there's a, a garden variety of, of theories uh, they can't be integrated, uh, and not one of them uh, can be can be dominant, and uh, the whole uh, bunch of them cannot really be integrated. So, uh, to me, it's surprising that you call yourself a positivist, unless that is your way of handling their handling the variety and diversity of, of theories to say, well, you have this and you have that and so on. Uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, and uh, I can't interrelate them, and I don't uh, select from them. Uh, does that uh, does does that fit with your uh, generally negative uh, attitude toward theory in general? I I, I didn't. If, if that's what you took away from me saying I'm a positivist, I, that's not what I meant. What I meant by a positivist was that I'm an empiricist. I I take theories. I look at their theorems and their axioms, I deduce hypotheses from them, and from these hypotheses I get data that I then test these hypotheses to see if I find data support for or against these theories. And in, and in that sense, in that sense, uh, gathering data, doing research, I see myself as a positivist. I'm certainly not anti-theory. Uh, I use theory. I, I don't consider myself a theorist, that, that's true. Uh, but I've been working with social control theory for, and you know, and if you wanted me to compare all these different theories, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I couldn't do it. But, but I do know social control theory pretty well because I've been working with it for most of my academic life. Now, I do think that some of these theories can be integrated. So the be I think the best example, is what I didn't go through here today because I wanted to open it up for some questions, was Samson and Lobb's uh, lifespan theory. But really, it's a, it's a type of control theory, too. It's not taking a motivational theory and trying to integrate it with a restraint <coughs> theory. It's taking one restraint and kind of a rational choice theory and a social capital theory, and it's making it age graded. So what, what's really neat about it is that it's really a control perspective but it's the first theory that's not limited to testing on juvenile delinquents. It's looking over the lifespan and looking at and, and saying that, gee, these controls can change over time. That if you get married, you know, you've got social capital in that marriage. Or if you get a job, you know, suddenly that's social capital that you don't want to lose by committing a crime. And so these are certainly seen as restraints, not motivations. And so I, I, think, I, think, they've, I think they fit together well in what they've done. Um, great summary. I really enjoyed it. And I, I thought it was interesting that you talked about, uh, and you were actually just mentioning the life course and developmental influences over time. What about over time in terms of our society? I'm thinking about the recent book, which I haven't had a chance to read yet, um, by Steven Pinker, a well known psychologist, called um, Better Angels, Angels of Our Nature, talking about what, how violence has declined in our society or around the world. So. What might social control theories have to say about about that looking? From that most, most, so, most social control theories 
<clears throat> Both social control theories cannot explain difference in crime rates. Okay. Most, most, well, deterrence can, okay, because that's, that, that's looking at those types of things. Uh, I'm, I don't think deterrence probably <laughs> made those changes in loss of violence. Yeah. But I would argue that, that most social control theories uh, can explain individual differences in crimes, but they aren't really going to help in trying to explain a crime rate. I think you have to look at other, uh, at other <coughs> theories to get to that. I'd like to follow, follow up on that because I had jotted down Pinker's book. I'm on the last chapter. Oh, really? <coughs> and it's, I, highly, I highly recommend it. Um, within the uh, plummy little field of criminology and criminal justice, I'm on the criminal justice side, not the criminology side. So that, um, for me, all of this, all of this work, um, whatever its internal validity, is for me only something that could be useful in terms of crime control. Does it really point the way to to modes of, of um, action that could be taken by social agencies, um, with or inside or outside of criminal justice, ideally? Justice and others. So Pinker makes, I think, a convincing case of something that criminologists have been aware of. You know, if we look at the historical declines of crime in the 19th century in England, that <clears throat> the imposition of the state brings crime rates way down. So anthropological studies seem to show that uh, violence is extremely high in tribal societies, and uh, the state uh, uh, influences. Uh, influences that behavior externally. And so that it always struck me that these these theories being generated in the US in the 20th century um, already took into account without really mentioning it a lot of a lot of um, social phenomena that that existed. And, you know, do they <coughs> do they take into account the difference say between uh, first generation Children of immigrants, whether they're internal immigrants from the South or whether they come come from Europe, but I'll I'll ask the question: um, Does this provide um, techniques or, or the basis for techniques that people working in um, in social agencies could use to reduce delinquency, or, or does it not have any? Has it had? Have these had any practical? That work there, in, the, in the whole crime adventure. There, there are different ways of looking at, at theories and and um, how good the theories are or whatever. And one is certainly is predictive quality, and and does it predict crime? And that and I, that's probably the most important. And you know most of the empirical research that shows that most of the social control theories can explain up to about 19, 20 percent. Explain variants. So there's a lot of variants left to be explained, but it's certainly as high, if not higher, than with many of the other theories. Another another thing to look at in terms of comparing theories and how good they are is looking at uh, what are the policy implications, which is which is what you're getting at. Uh, social control theory probably has as many policy implications, if not more, than most theories do. So if you take, let, let me take a couple examples. Uh, Hershey's idea that he talked about attachment, uh, belief, commitment, and involvement. Involvement essentially is uh, idle hands or the devil's workshop. If you can keep kids busy, <coughs> then you can keep them off the streets and out of trouble. How many after school baseball programs and Saturday basketball programs and public sector you know, community recreation programs that we had trying to do just that. Now they don't work <laughs> necessarily, but they came, they were directly related to that whole idea. Self-control is, uh, according to Godfrey and Hershey, is a direct result of family management practices. And so if we can get parents to do a better job of parenting, then we should be able to of knowing when to reward punishments, how to punish, how to punish kids, things of like that, how to monitor their behaviors, 
And there are a lot of things that come out of the Oregon uh, Social Learning Institute uh, uh, from Gerald Patterson and such showing that if you can use positive and negative reinforcers and train parents to know when to do this, it can have a big effect upon uh, not necessarily delinquency but, uh, because there are more psychological studies but misbehaving among, among juveniles. So there have been um, crime prevention programs oh, yeah. designed in yeah. part on these theories. Yeah. What do you think is a good direction for future research on social control theory? Why do people always ask that? Uh, I, I, think, I think there'll be more longitudinal research in the future. I, I think that, uh, I think that uh, this lifespan theory will probably generate some more longitudinal types of theories. Uh, the problem, one of the major problems with Hershey's bonding theory, which is probably the most wide, widely tested of the theory, is that it's, it's static. And it predicts that you know, <coughs> low attachments to parents will increase juvenile delinquency. Yet a lot of studies have shown that there's a reciprocal effect. So that delinquency also lowers the attachment that the kid has to the parent. So it's not just a one-way arrow. And, and that's, that's, not, that's not just a problem with social control theory, that's a problem with many criminological theories. That, that they're static, they're a snapshot in time, uh, or photograph. Uh, and, I, and I think probably over time, the problem of course is, is getting the NFS money or NSF money or whatever to get data for longitudinal studies. I'm, I'm actually, uh, I collected some data when I was at Eastern Michigan uh, from, student, from students there. I did, a, I did a random sample of college students, about eight or 900 college students. And actually, I've, I've uh, testing life course theory with cross-sectional data. Because I'm comparing, for example, student, but, but it's really, it's looking at longitudinal lifespan types of predictions, testing it with cross-sectional data. And I think it can be done. So, I, so for example, I'm looking at, uh, I'm comparing married students with unmarried students to see if that, to see if that marriage change has an effect upon lowering, lowering crime, and it does. So when you compare married with unmarried, the married students have a lower <coughs> crime rate among these students than those who are unmarried. When I look at those students who are living at home and are still under the influence of the parents, for example, for example, and compare them to students who are freer, have fewer restrictions and constraints on their behaviors, who live in dormitories, I find a big difference in crime. So that even after controlling on social class and a lot of other variables, that kids living at home have lower crime rates than those living on campus. And then if you break, break it down even further, I find some further evidence that, and, and this is really kind of a combination of lifespan theory with with social control or with with social bonding theory uh, in, in terms of where I'm looking at it, because I'm looking at both attachments to their present parents along with attachments of social capital they have in the marriage, which is more lifespan theory. But I think more of a I think I think we have to go more towards longitudinal theories and testing of the theories. And I think but I think I think the data will be fewer and far between because it will be so costly. Sometimes it's fun to get out of our get out of uh, the group of our of our uh, discipline. Uh, as I was thinking about the shift that the Hershey took towards self control, I thought hmm, that would be a, a great setup for somebody who wanted to get an earmark to set up an academy for young boys. And then I thought about the Spartan mode of uh, of integrating all children into, and they certainly were highly successful in uh, taking uh, every young Spartan citizen. Uh, taking them away from their parents, putting them in, you know, just uh, putting them all through a, a same very rigorous 
control process that was brutal, and in, in fact involved committing crimes, but it, it turned out a very uniform set of uh, the most disciplined soldiers in, uh, in the ancient world. So it's, it's so Gopherson and Hershey actually make an argument they, that you can, you can test longitudinal theory, or you can test all theories with cross-sectional data just as well as with longitudinal data. That it, I mean, they argue that. that Really, you don't need well, I'm just saying that I think ancient Sparta might, might provide something of, a, of, a, of, an, of an example. Uh, do they deal with, uh, I mean, there must be some subcultures out there that, that positively value criminality. Well, the, the subcultural theorists would certainly argue that. Mm. Does that ever work in here, or do they? Well, work in. I um, mean, do any of these theories work that in? No, they don't really. It's not really part of these series. The other question here. Yeah, yeah thank you for your presentation. Um, my question has to do with the changing definition of family. Um, how responsive is the series to that? It's um, 50s, you were talking about broken families, so obviously no, not non-nuclear. But with most families now being non-nuclear families or um, cohabitating parents, how does the theory um, respond to that? <clears throat> well, mo most, most social control theories would argue that's not whether or not the family is broken. It's the quality of the relationship between the remaining parent and the adolescent. Now, with that said, you know, and there are different definitions of, of broken homes, and it's even kind of a bad term to use broken. It makes it sound like a negative, you know, negative type of thing. Uh, but there is, there is, and I've done a lot of research on broken homes and uh, with Ed Wells, uh, and what we find is that there is a relationship, but it's really small. It tends to be higher among research that uses official statistics than what uses self-reported statistics, and it tends to be a higher relationship for the less serious types of crimes, like running away from home or acting out types of behaviors relative to, you know, uh, burglary or stealing or theft or something like that. And, it's, and the relationship is small enough that it's nothing that, uh, as, as Mark brought up earlier, we wouldn't want to make public policy decisions on it. So I think, I think most, uh, and, and I've also done some research that indicates that, that that relationship might simply be because of a loss of parent. Not that they're doing a bad job, but when you have two high attachments to parents in a, in a integrated model of family, the only thing going wrong maybe in the broken home uh, is that there aren't two parents there. But also, you know, those homes probably have a lower standard of living. They might, they might uh, when they get divorced or whatever, Oftentimes, the remaining parent has to move because, because of a big loss of income. And so they might be SES types of factors, too. And, and I think social control theorists, including myself, have tried to look to see if that's not where the relationship lies rather than in the parenting of, 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 the, of, of the parents. I guess what I'm curious about is uh, if you're using official statistics and they talk about families, they're generally going to use official definitions of what a family is. So do they talk about different types of families, or do they just strictly stick with biological families? Is that what I'm describing? Well, but the, most, the most common definition of a, of a broken home in the literature, regardless of if it's self-reports or official statistics, is the loss of at least one biological parent. Now, there have been a number of studies that have tried to break that down further. Like, does the death of a parent versus a, versus, uh, you know, a divorce, does that make a difference? If the mother, if it's the mother who has the children, does the mother have higher attachments with daughters and with sons and broken it down that way? So there's been a lot of breaking down of what's going on here. And most of it finds very little difference in, in regard to what's going on. But, but in regard to your question, there, there, isn't, there isn't any difference in terms of how uh, broken homes is officially defined versus for self-reported stuff. Uh, despite the fact that you've all felt positive, you have shown... We're back to that again. <laughs> okay. I am, anyway. Okay. Uh, 
you have showed wide knowledge of theory in general, uh, high level, low level, whatever. Um, I was wondering, because you didn't mention Marxism before, and uh, Marxism is one of the um, major sociological theories. I was wondering, uh, would Marxism, to what degree does it fit social control theory, uh, and or possibly along the way, you might bring in functionalism and exchange theory and interactionism? Yeah, well, they, there have been integrate well, uh, power control theory. Uh, Hagen took Marxist theory, integrated it with social control theory, came up with power control theory. So there you go. So here you have a very radical <clears throat> theory being integrated with the neoclassical conservative theory. Yeah, he integrated the two. So there you go. So it can be done. And, and, and a lot of the other theories have been integrated in some form or another with social control. 